Welcome. I'm Sarah Davis. I'm the chair of City Lights Women in Power Group. I can't tell you how excited I am to see all of you here today and celebrate International Women's Day with this amazing event. Uh, we are recognizing our strong female leadership that powers our city and it is just so inspiring to see all the faces that have turned out today. So thank you so much for being here. We're seated in a room named after Seattle's first mayor, Bertha Knight Landis, our second female mayor, who it only took us a shade under a century to elect, but better late than never, is about to speak. We have a council supermajority with six of our nine seats being occupied by women. Forty-four percent of our department heads are also women. These are historic numbers. In the words of Lin-Manuel Miranda, I saw Hamilton a few weeks ago and I can't resist. Uh, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. History is happening and we just happen to be in the greatest city in the world. Are we a city insulated from ugliness and the issues plaguing the rest of the country? Hardly. Do we have a culture that must change in order for everyone to feel truly accepted, safe, and empowered? Absolutely. However, seeing you all here today indicates that there is hope, desire, and the ability to come together as a city to continue to make progress on these goals. Today's event is titled Women in Power Press for Progress. From the days of BKL, we've definitely made progress, but we have a ways to go. Uh, but as a city, we can continue not only to press, but to actually make forward progress to enact the change that we wish to see. That hope, that desire, and that ability makes us great. And it's those reasons that make me believe that we truly are lucky to be alive right now. We have an impressive lineup of speakers on the docket today, and it just so happens that today marks our first speaker's 100th day in office. <laughs> which seems a very pleasant and fitting coincidence that it happens to fall on International Women's Day. <laughs> So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our mayor, Jenny Durkin. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna say what she said. Um, I also, I was fortunate, I was able to see Hamilton last week too, and you know, I went in thinking, I purposely not read about it, too much about it, although you can't avoid it, had not listened to the music because I thought, okay, I don't want to spoil it and maybe it's hype. Enraptured. Um, and the word I want to use is for International Women's Day to steal from Hamilton, um, this is a movement, not a moment. Um, we are so lucky to be living in this city and in this time, but we also have to acknowledge where we came from. You know, I see the faces around this room. I want to acknowledge some of the people who are either elected officials or in my cabinet. And while you all are special to me, I'd like those people to stand up just so they can, you know, how committed they are. So don't be shy. Come on, Bags. Come on, Carmen. <laughs> Teresa. Guys <laughs> back there. Monica, you don't get away. Stand up. We have to start thanking everyone about what does it mean to have a in women in power at City Light? That your agency and departments are willing to have this kind of gathering to mark this kind of day. But more importantly to say, who are we as a city? 
and what do we stand for. You're going to be hearing from really amazing strong women here today in the first and the second panel. I'm sorry that the city council members aren't here, but we have an amazing city council and the women on that council truly are women of power. Um, they represent our city so well. Um, I also want to give a shout out, while well, most of my remarks are going to be that it's International Women's Day, to all the men in the room. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm a proud mom of two sons, um, and I know that we all got to be here shoulder to shoulder together. I also do, though, want to address some words to, to the women and not just the women. We know we need to do better in the workplace in Seattle, not just at City Light, but in, in throughout the city. And I want to give you my word as mayor that we will work as hard as we can to make sure that everyone feels welcome and safe in their workplace. There's no reason at all that people should go to work where they're going to do the people's business and give up themselves that they can't feel entirely safe in their workplace. So I promise to you, we're going to work hard on that. Um, and thank you for your all the input you've given me as mayor. It doesn't feel like 100 days in many ways. It feels shorter. And in other ways, it feels like it's dog years. You know, every, every day is full. But I want you to know that. I also want to say for all the women and girls in Seattle, this is your day to remember that our voices, our vision, our persistence, our intelligence, and our brilliance has to be recognized every day in every way. Um, we talk a lot about what is a human right, and women have struggled for centuries, um, and the struggle still continues. We don't have equal pay. You know, I think it is not a coincidence that in a city as progressive as Seattle is, that that chair back there, which was Bertha Knight's chair, has sat empty for 92 years for a woman to fill it. You know, we can, it's not that there haven't been brilliant women in this city, creative women, dedicated women on the city council and throughout different places, but for many reasons, the power came together to exclude women from that dynamic. And that's why I think we all have to carry with us every day, not just what our own passions are, but how do we make sure that as we open doors for women, we are opening doors for everyone, for everyone, to make sure that whether it is race or gender or sexual preference, that when we kick that door open, we don't slam it shut for the people behind us who need that same thing. It's a continual struggle. It is something we have to keep in mind because we get busy, we get tired. Um, I'm not just the first woman in 92 years. I'm the first mom to have the job in 92 years, you know? <laughs> And believe me, I know what it's like to be rushing for that school pickup, the daycare pickup, the school conference, the soccer game, and you're late. Or what it's like to in the morning saying, you know, what do you mean this five kinds of cereal because that's all that's left isn't a good breakfast. <laughs> or, you know, somehow that takeout is really what normal people do day in, day out. Um, but we know that we're under assault, and it's not just women, it's everyone. You know, they're trying to take away women's right to choose in Washington, D.C. every way they can. They're trying to take away the protections for the air we breathe and that our children breathe. They're trying to roll back all the protections on climate to make sh and deny that our world is under threat. And they're also taking women from children and deporting families in a way that is cruel and inhumane. Every day there's an onslaught from Washington, D.C. And while I am focused on the business of the city and those basic city services that everyone in this room is delivering, we also have to realize that we have a duty and obligation to make sure that we protect people, we make people welcome, and we do not let them roll back our values in their quest for power. So though it is just International Women's Day, we have to remember that the stand for liberty is never for just one gender or one group, one race. Um, it must be a stand for everyone. Because if we do not stand together for those values, certainly none of us will survive in the values that we want. So thank you very much for taking your time to be here. I, I think it is going to be a great day 
I know that we have to keep persisting in the workplace, but outside of the workplace. And just looking around this room at the tables of people I've seen, each of you bring not just to where you work your sense of what is right and wrong, you bring it back into your communities, your churches, your organizations you volunteer in. And so know that we value that because that is what makes our city the great city it is. So thank you most for your work. Celebrate all the sisters today on International Women's Day. And remember, we don't just get one day. All right, thanks so much. Um, I have the privilege of starting off with some of the questions. Um, so our first question will be, uh, as leaders, we need to identify the support necessary for our ongoing success and often the support that enabled our journey. Could you please talk about your journey to your current position and comment on the support you received and its impact? Do I go at once or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll jump in with a, a story about my support and I look at how I arrived here today and it was a lot of little incremental milestones and I want to share one of my initial journeys is this starts back in my college days where I felt like I had peers and professors that advocated for me and I happened to be sitting in class one day and a peer of mine said I've got this great job doing computer data entry. I didn't quite know what that was, but I do know that the pay was twice what I was currently earning in my part-time job. And I said, I think I can do that. And I jumped right in. But at that moment in that classroom, I had somebody advocating for me as well that said, yes, you can. Go find out more. So I think that's just one example of a story for me that really changed the course of my career. It got me involved in technology and computers. And it was, um, at the moment, it didn't seem like a big deal, but looking back, it was, it was huge. So yeah. that's just one yeah. example for me. Great. Well, I would say, um, from first it starts at home. I know that sounds very cliche, but it's actually true. I had parents. I was the oldest of four children. I am the oldest of four children. Um, and they really instilled in us um, the values of resilience, hard work, you know, honesty, integrity, you know, and doing, uh, you know, the golden rule and, and giving back to others. That that has stayed with me my whole career and helped me along the way. You have to have good values, sound judgment, um, you know, as you're coming through. And I've had some wonderful people help me. I I can't even name them all. I, I'm afraid I'm going to miss out on some names, but. Uh, all along the way, people, men, women, um, you know, all different um, professions help me out um, and give me advice and thoughts, uh, sometimes unsolicited, but I got it all, <laughs> all along the way, and it, it really was very helpful to me. And I can tell you that um, one of the things, is the, the theme of this panel is lift as you rise, and one of the things that I think is so true and so important that as people move up, as they get positions, they're very intentional and deliberate about helping others get you know, into positions as well. And that's happened for me from both men and women and all sorts of people who, for whatever reason, saw something in me that they thought would be helpful and help me along. And I have really been deliberate about trying to do the same thing for others. It is so important. And I can tell you most recently, um, when I was a captain at the South Precinct, I was too long you know, up Myrtle Avenue and I got a call um, from uh, the then chief and said, hey, could you, I'd like to make you the an assistant chief. And I was like, what? I didn't, you know, yeah, but you know, um, he saw something in me. He, he thought I had uh, the ability to do it. And after a little bit of um, discussion, you know, I took the position. So it's so important that you're deliberate about bringing people along, helping them, encouraging them, letting them know that they have the ability to do the work that you're asking. And, and, they'll, and they'll rise up to the occasion. And in fact, they'll probably do better than what you expected because they want to show um, that your support and your, and your help of them um, 
was worthwhile. So, you know, while I'm not going to name everything off along the way, I will say that a number of people have stepped in, and certainly my most recent, um, my most recent boss, Chief O'Toole, was really helpful uh, to me. You know, she gave me a chance to be the deputy chief. I think it shocked a lot of people, but I stepped right in. Um, felt like we had two women in charge. Couldn't have felt better about it, more energized, and more. It's like, yes, yeah, us, those two girls, we're doing it. Yeah, it was great. You know, so. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so my story also starts at home. I was born and raised in India, and as many of you probably know, India is quite a patriarchy. But in my house, uh, women ruled. My my father, you know, it was always you can all you can be whatever you want to be. You don't have to be a doctor or an engineer or any of that. And uh, you know, and I grew up in a household where I saw my parents model what they wanted their kids to be, where where people, you treated people with respect, mm -hmm. with dignity, with you worked hard, and if you worked hard and you did what you needed to do, uh, you would succeed. Um, and so that's, that's what I bring to my job here. Um, I have a little story. Um, when Mayor Durkin offered me the job, I said, well, you know, I have a six-year-old. And her response was fabulous, you know. And so my six-year-old is here today. She's so cute. Because uh, <laughs> you know, I I try to live the life that I want my my daughter to see that you can be whatever you want to be, and so that's how. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so the next, we'll move on. Um, there are often specific tools or methods as we as women use to help empower each other. One such tool is amplifying. Amplifying was called out in a recent Huffington Post article discussing how women on President Obama's male majority staff found their voice. The article calls out female staffers being man-terrupted or their ideas appropriated. These women would often echo their fellow colleagues' ideas or statements to ensure credit and support was given. Have you used amplification in your careers, or are there other tools you have used to empower the women around you? Let me jump in. Absolutely. You know, it's one of it's it's well known, it's well documented in research that you know often when I've always, for whatever reason, ended up in these places where I'm one of the few women in the room. You know, just by default. So you want to make sure that um, you that everyone's being heard. And I don't, I'm not saying it's intentional on anyone's part, but it, it, sometimes it tends to be that some voices in the room just don't get heard as loudly or as clearly as others. So part of that is ensuring when someone's talking or if, if someone were to break into that, say, oh, wait a minute, so-and-so hasn't finished their thought yet, right? You know, you need to be intentional about that, making sure, and it's not just for women, but just sometimes even the less strong personalities in the room don't get heard. We want to make sure that everyone is adding to the discussion, because that's what makes you know, that's what makes things better when we bring different thought and ideas to the conversation. So I'm very intentional about that, wanting to make sure that um, you know everyone at the table is heard. And certainly the women at the table are being heard as well. So I, I, I think that is really important. And I think there are, there are men also who do that, but just bringing that to the conversation so that people are aware of it and being conscious of it, like, you know, that sort of almost like that implicit biasing, am I, am I not listening to certain people at the table? I need to, you know, and think about it and be very deliberate. So yes, I definitely do that. Um, amen. <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to give you a little glimpse into what it is to work uh, in Mayor Durkin's office, and I think it's fitting that we're here uh, at the Bertha Knight Landis room. Uh, we have an office full of badass women. I mean, <laughs> women who just get stuff done. And, and it is a culture where people support each other, uh, that we uh, make room for each other. And you know, and this is not a, a diss against the men. The men are pretty amazing too. But it is, we are hoping to set um, a tone for this for the city that you can be women at all levels of government and you can lead and you can be powerful and you bring value to the table mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's something that's long overdue and you know before I came here I ran a nonprofit and we were majority women and really I worked in transportation it's pretty male dominated uh, I was often the only woman in the room uh, most definitely often though 
the, mo the only woman of color in a room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really encourage my staff to think about how can we create space for, for women to come sure. into these fields to be able to, uh, to, to lift them up, but also I think to, to recognize that we still have some ways to go before we can truly say that, uh, mm -hmm. that there's equality. Right, that's right. I wanted to mention as part of this conversation, when you are giving that space and you're listening, there's a follow-up component which is showing your appreciation. And so you can actually um, weave both elements into your discussions when you're facilitating. And it may be creating that space for someone to raise their voice, but at the end of the session or the moment, taking that time to show your appreciation for a particular person's idea or thought is just another way to reinforce that you're hearing, you're showing your appreciation, and you're saying thank you. And I think wrapping those things together is a great way to show support for anybody that's trying to broach a new idea or be heard. So I wanted to mention that that's another factor that I think is really important with this amplification, is taking the time to show your appreciation when they have made the effort to share an idea. Well, thank you, Tracy. And we, <laughs> we appreciate it. It was a great example. <laughs> All right. Um, so mentoring is often viewed as a way for individuals, especially those from underrepresented communities, to find support and seek valuable insight or guidance while navigating their careers. Have you had mentors in your careers, and can you speak to what made that relationship impactful for you? So I've had a lot of mentors um, in my life, and I think that uh, the trick is to, to think of mentors as 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 people that sometimes come into your life by accident or sometimes you've intentionally uh, sought them out. And I think I've had both of those uh, groups of people and they've been both men and women. And I think that uh, I, I enjoy mentoring young women and men. Uh, I think everyone has a little bit of a mentor in them. Uh, there is no set formula for what mentorship should look like. It is. Uh, being available to offer advice, to, to be a sounding board, and sometimes just be somebody who is just willing to listen, right? And I think that we can all do that in different ways. And uh, so I, I often challenge people who tell me, oh, no, you know, I think of mentors a certain way. It's like, no, it's somebody who listens and someone who offers a space to have a conversation. I would agree, I think mentoring is really important and there's formal mentors and sort of informal mentors and they're all, all different, I would say, levels. I mean, you would be surprised how many, you know, officers or, you know, that I talk to that help me make, you know, what I believe are good decisions um, because, you know, you need to be talking to everybody and get everybody's perspective. And I also talk to people outside of, you know, Seattle, outside of this organization, organization who are also in law enforcement, other women from other places in the country that can provide input and thought about what's happening happening there. So I'm really, you know, again, I use the word deliberate, but deliberate about, you know, finding formal mentors, but also informal mentors from different um, spaces and, and levels in the organization. I think it's really important for myself. And it's also important to mentor other people. Um, you know, you know, humbly, you kind of think, well, why would somebody want to talk to me about anything? But, but you know, they, they do. They want to know kind of how you got to where you are, what things are important to you. Uh, and it's important that we share that and have discussions. So uh, if you if you aren't mentoring somebody in some capacity, I, I think it would be a good thing to try. Even um, even if it's just young people, it doesn't necessarily have to be you know in your profession. I talk to young people all the time about different things and different aspects, and certainly trying to bring them into law enforcement. A lot of folks don't consider it, so I want to make sure that, that they look at it as an opportunity as well. So um, mentoring from both sides, either being mentored or providing mentorship, is very very important. So I, I certainly support that. One of the aspects that I've learned about mentorship is I kind of think of mentorship in the moment. It doesn't have to be a single person through your career. It could be many different sound bites. And the other thing that I have learned a lot being a parent is that sometimes your mentors are your children. That they are sound boards and they are completely honest with you. And sometimes that's what you need in a mentorship. So 
you have to be receptive of where you're receiving your mentorship and look for it in unexpected places. There's nothing like asking your kid, hey, I've got a technology presentation. Do you understand this? <laughs> <laughs> and you get wonderful advice. So I think you have to really embrace it from all different angles. And I have really appreciated when I've asked my children, my children's friends, and the young people how something resonates with them. That is very telling for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. OK. So uh, this year, the theme for International Women's Day is Press for Progress. Can you please comment on what progress does and should look like in each of your departments? Oh. Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was like a time thing. <laughs> well, I'll, you know, I can start with this. So you know, there are so many different things that we're looking at. Um, you know. And, and policing in general. One thing, I, the way I always like to start is that policing is not what you see on TV. It's not all car chases and gunfights and people repelling off buildings. You know, what we do is a service. I mean, by and large, day in, day out, it is service. We see people in some really vulnerable, at that moment, really vulnerable situations. And we often are providing um, outreach to them in some ways, providing some relief to them in some ways, you know, helping them, sometimes as suspects or victims, mm -hmm. right? So it is, it is really about service. It is actually, um, by and large, what we do. And so I start out by saying, you know, progress means that we're able to provide service to people in a way that um, they feel included and, and respected and they feel equity. And we know we have some work to do on, on those lines. And I started, um, my time, you know, as the interim chief, uh, just talking about the five priorities that we're going to have at the department, and the, one of the first ones was excellence in service. You know, that's that's what we need to do. We need to provide service to the community that we serve, uh, and do so in a way that we're trying to be as excellent as possible, uh, along with fighting crime and using data and all those other things, and really making sure that people feel connected to. Um, what we do. You know, we're just people. We need to humanize ourselves. I think when people start seeing the police is not the police over there, but they're the police. They're just people. They're moms, their dads, their sisters, their brothers, their cousins. The, the uniform it really just identifies us so that we can be seen and known when we're in the room. But quite frankly, you know, we're just people like everyone else. And once we start humanizing ourselves and it becomes not um, the police in the community, it becomes just us, right, doing the work that we need to do to help us. I think we will have reached great success. And I'm looking for that day. I think we're going to get there. Um, we're not quite there yet, but I really, truly believe that um, you know, we're all going to be unified and joined, and people are going to feel you know, like the police department is a part of them, and we're a part of the community. So, that's, that's it. <laughs> hey. So in the technology world, what I would hope in the future for the department is that when we are building our workforce, that it doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, what sex you are, that you feel like this is an area that you want to be a part of, and that we provide those opportunities, and we provide growth for all of our employees going forward. And we, we have a structure where we have the ability to treat people as individuals and holistically across the workforce. So I look at how the youth are coming into our different industries, and I want them to be excited about technology. I want them to see that there are so many opportunities. And I'd like the perception of, I think when you talk about technology, you think of somebody hunched over a computer, um, really isolated. And what I would like is for us to be embraced as an organization that is a part of many great things that are happening across the city. And we're not an island, but we are serving our customers. Mm -hmm. And an individual coming into our workforce sees how valued they are as part of our bigger community, and that we are much more than a series of zeros and ones in a technology. <laughs> that we are helping to make great things happen. 
Oh, can I add something? Because you triggered yeah. something in me with your comments. Tra thank you, Tracy. Yeah, you know, and also one of the important things I just forgot to mention is we really want the police department to reflect the community that we serve, right? So definitely we want to see more people of color, more women, uh, you know, LGBTQ, so that people know that the police department is connected to them. So I just wanted to add that little piece. <laughs> So um, from the mayor's office perspective, I mean, Mayor Durkin outlined her vision for a vibrant, inclusive, and affordable city, right? And I think that um, Seattle is at crossroads. Uh, we are in experiencing incredible prosperity, but we're also seeing incredible disparity. And I think that uh, this is going to be our greatest challenge, is how do we create a community where everyone can thrive? Um, and how do we as a city be a force for progress? Uh, how can we, you know, I, I came from outside city government and in my short time here, I have been amazed by how dedicated city employees are. People come here to do good, to, to make a difference in people's lives and how can we continue to do that, do that better? Uh, make sure that we're reaching more people. Uh, and quite frankly, I think we are also in a moment where we have to create a safe and inclusive workplace environment and create a place where employees feel comfortable, they feel welcomed, and they feel like they are contributing um, as city employees. And I think that leadership starts from the top at the mayor's office, and you heard from Mayor Durkin, we're fully committed to that that work moving forward. Uh, but I think that, you know, it's going to take all of us. I think there's no magic bullet, and I think that these are, yeah, these are sticky, um, enduring problems and I think that we have to really think of ourselves as a city that is is creative that is thinking outside the box and really using the skills that we bring to the table in ways that can help solve uh, our community's greatest challenges Great. okay so next question you guys have sort of touched on a little bit of this but um, so professional development is an essential part of anyone's career what role does professional development play in the press for progress Am I going to go? Okay, I'll just start. So, um, well, it's really important that um, you start thinking about those things, that you just don't fall into it. So uh, we worked really hard in, in the Seattle Police Department continue to uh, really work on professional development. I would love to take credit and say that it started with me, but it actually started with um, the former chief, but I am definitely continuing that on. We have uh, mid-level managers training. We have, uh, we want to make sure people are involved in Leadership Tomorrow, Seattle, the uh, mentorship program, the um, Senior Management Institute for, for Police, the FBI National all the things that help you build up your knowledge about the profession, you get to interact and network with other people, um, and also help build education for folks uh, out there. We make, we're very, very intentional about it. We're working with our, um, I'm going to throw his name out there, Mike Fields, who's our HR director, has done an amazing job about being very deliberate about ensuring that we are including not only officers but civilians too. You know, sometimes the civilian part of our organization doesn't get as much attention, but we have uh, almost 600 civilian employees who don't wear a uniform and come in every day. We want to make sure that we're being inclusive, we're including them, and we're being very deliberate about ensuring that they are um, able to be successful and advance and have the right um, you know, re resume, if you will, but basically the right education to do the job well. And I think that's very important. People feel, even if they don't advance, they just feel better about themselves because they do more and they know more, right? And they're just better at working um, when, when we uh, pro provide them those opportunities. So I think that's very important. I was gonna say that I do believe that professional development is very important and from a couple of different angles we should be encouraging each other to look within ourselves and go, what do we need? Um, be an advocate for ourselves when we need those extra assistance. From a management perspective, you want to be a facilitator for those. And what we want to do is not have this happen accidentally, but on purpose. Mm -hmm. And so making steps in our organizations to help people grow professionally and to have them advocate for themselves in some cases and have management also assist with that journey. 
Both of those are important aspects to growing our workforce. If you look at technology, so much is going to change in the next 10 years. And so how do you help us as an organization prepare for that from a multitude of different ways? There's succession planning, the individual, how a manager helps their workforce, and trying to anticipate where we're going in the world and being ahead of the curve. It's difficult. We may need have we may have room for improvement there, but that's something that we should make a concerted effort to, to do. Really quickly, I think we just need to foster a culture of learning, and that's professional development, but that's also more than that. It is learning from each other. Uh, I do one-on-ones with my department directors, and I have to tell you, every single conversation I have with them, I learn something new. So I think there's that, and then there is creating a space or a culture where it's okay to fail. I think for, for women in particular, uh, the, the fear of failure is intense. I mean, we're constantly worried. We're working twice as hard to show that we're, we're good enough. And I think that we have to, as women in leadership, we have an opportunity to, to help break that cycle. That it's OK to fail. That it's OK to admit that you don't know. It's OK to ask questions. Because I think that's when you really learn. And that's really something that I'm hoping that, particularly with the people I work with is how do we foster that culture of learning and failure? And fail, failure can be OK sometimes. Yeah, that's a great point. All right. The city has looked at and endorsed some programs such as accommodating work schedules and locations, paid parental leave, and flexibility to care for ailing family members. Have you seen these sorts of programs make a difference in making women feel more valued and understood in the workplace? So how about I start as the newest city employee? Um, you know, I got to bring my daughter to work today. And I am grateful for that flexibility. Um, but it also, being a mother is, it adds value to who I am as a professional. And I think we have to create a as a city, create spaces, and, and you know, I want to recognize that that flexibility doesn't always work. But I think that we have to think about how do we welcome people into the city workforce. What are the barriers that are preventing people, or whether they are, you know, around education or around flexibility in work schedules? Uh, but I think that. I think of flexibility much more broadly than just a set of benefits. The benefits are great, but I think it's sort of reimagining what work looks like. And uh, for me, you know, in the mayor's office, there isn't a nine to five. You know, sometimes you work a lot and sometimes you don't, and that's okay. As long as the work gets done, that's what is what I place value on. But I think that's. You know, I just want us to think about, OK, what does flexibility look like? And what are the things that we can do to attract an even greater diversity in the workforce? Great. Yeah, we don't really have, you know, it's law enforcement. We don't really have a lot of flexibility in the schedules. And honestly, I wouldn't want to drag my daughter when I was working patrol out with me every day. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, you guys don't want to come out of that. But, um, but, you know, we, what I think is really important is that we work on some of the um, employee um, assistance issues, that making sure that people are whole and um, you know everything is going OK in their world when they come in. You know, and it's just unique. I mean, I have on me you know, a gun and handcuffs and pepper spray and all of those things. So we want to make sure that when people are coming to work doing the work that we do, that they are in a good place. Right, and if they're and as a I, I, you know as a supervisor, it's really important that we have the flexibility to say you know if something's going on in your life, we're just people, right? Some people have divorces, their kids get sick, they have elderly parents that they need to take care of. That we give them the space to do those things and don't drag them in. Make sure they have to come into work all the time. Uh, I've been a pretty high stress job, you know, uh, so we're really conscious of that, of making sure that people are checking in with their own mental health, um, with their own physical health, um, so that they can do the be better work. And if we're flexible along those lines, we get a better product in the end. And by us getting a better product, that means you get a better product, right? The community that we're supposed to be serving. So uh, that's a really critical uh, piece of the work that we're doing. Uh, we just don't have that latitude for, you know, coming in. Flexible shifts isn't, you know, usually one of the things we can do, but there are a whole host of other things that we can do to make sure our employees are, you know, safe and whole at work. And we're working really hard to make sure we do it. I think 
No matter what your job is, sometimes there's opportunity for different types of flexibility. And it depends on how you, what you're supporting and where you're working. What I think the challenge is, is we need to look at how we help the individual because what works for one person doesn't work for another. And so there's an important piece of this is taking advantage of the things that you can offer, but reminding ourselves that the person receiving that is an individual. And so what makes sense for a person that has two teenage kids may be different than someone that has an aging parent. But showing that you're treating them as an individual in this circumstance and helping them through whatever avenues are appropriate for them to explore is an important piece of this. And so my message is make sure that we understand that flexibility is germane to the individual and don't lose sight of that. Thank you. Okay, so wrapping up, keep an eye on the time. <laughs> um, reflecting on your career, what would you tell the newly graduating or the initially employed versions of yourself? Oh, wow, what would yeah. I say? Yeah. I'll go. Yeah, go ahead. Um, take chances. Um, mm -hmm. My young, um, unencumbered self, <laughs> I, you know, I think that too often we're, we're scared to take risks. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't have any regrets. And actually, I have a notebook that says I regret nothing, which, <laughs> which is, but I think that it is take chances, is take risks, uh, particularly professionally, because I think it is harder to do it as you get further along in your professional career. And, uh, you know, and I think that that's something that we could use a little bit more of, is a little bit more spontaneity. I, um, so the, the take chances piece, but one of the things that I ask myself when I'm deciding whether or not I should do something is I go, do I want to say no because I'm afraid? And if that's the only reason that I want to say no, I, I say, that's not a good excuse, Tracy. <laughs> you're you're going to go do it because if the only reason I'm saying no is because I'm afraid, that's a deal that I've struck in with myself, that that's not going to be who I'm going to be. The, the other story that I want to share is sometimes hearing no is a very powerful piece of moving forward. And one of the things that, this was long ago, but I was interviewing for different positions. And I happened to have a question to the person that was interviewing me, and I said, what are the career paths? going forward, if I land this position, where can I go from here? Mm -hmm. And the person responded to me and said, well, that's my job, and you can't have it. <laughs> <laughs> so I told myself, you know what? No, I can tell right now that that's not the job for me. <laughs> I have a desire to move forward. And so looking back to my younger self, I think it was an important message to that person to say, you know what, ask for what you want, have the confidence to ask those questions, and if it's not a good fit, be okay and say, no, this right. isn't where I want to go. Great. Yeah, when I think of my younger self, I was probably, you know, I was pretty confident, actually. <laughs> I, told, I told you what my background was. You know, we were pretty confident. But if I was giving advice to young people coming in, um, what, and sometimes I do, it's like, just, you know, risk taking is good, but also being resilient. You are going to fail at something. It's OK you know, to, to try something. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe you don't make it the first time. But um, it's OK to do that. And I, I'm going back, I'm harkening back to what comments were made earlier by our deputy mayor. But you know, sometimes you do you have that feeling that you're afraid to fail. You don't want people to think you can't do it. You know, you got you to gotta get past that. You have to have confidence in yourself. Be OK with being resilient. That's what resilience is about. Not everything is going to work out 100% every time. That's OK. Uh, this is your opportunity to figure out what it is and, and move forward. So that's, um, that's the advice I would pass on to my younger self. Yeah. All right. So uh, last question. Are there any imparting ideas as we close that offer what it means to be a female employee at the city of Seattle and what we must do to answer the national calling for progress? Say that one more time so I make sure. sure. That right. <laughs> 
Are there any imparting ideas as we close that offer what it means to be a female employee at the city of Seattle and what we must do to answer the national calling for progress? Well, it's International Women's Day. You know, I mean, you know, one of the things that I would say, obviously, is that this city has done a really good job. We got some work to do, but a really good job of making sure that women are in leadership positions and continuing on and um, you know, doing the work that needs to be done. And I want to go back just to make sure I hit the right place. So parting thoughts about what we need to do to make, to just, I, I go back to being resilient being confident, networking, lifting each other. That is the whole point of this, um, this discussion, is talking about lifting each other up as we rise and being very deliberate and intentional about it. Making sure that everyone at the table has a voice at the table. You know, male, female, black, white, gay, straight, Catholic, Protestant, whatever. Everybody gets to, to contribute and feel a part of the larger organization, because not everybody gets to be at the top. That's just, there's only so much space there, but that doesn't mean that your effort, your energy, um, isn't contributing to the success of the city, you know, the community that we're here for. So I would, that would be my parting thought. Make sure that you're giving and, and that you're contributing. When you mention those ideas about how we move things ahead, one of the things that comes to mind is not only do you look at what you have at the city, but what can you do outside of your city domain? And for me, it's all about that next generation. And part of this, because I'm a mother and I see my kids moving through their lives and wondering what can I do to help them be successful and be something that makes the community that you live in a better place. And so for me, it's not only what can you do within the city, but what can you do at home how do you encourage those school systems, internships, that youth that is coming into our city as potential employees, how do you make them successful? And you know, personally, that's being the best parent that I can for my children, being involved in the community and schools in the area. Those are all avenues that I pursue that I think will make the city a better place and the city of Seattle a better employment area. So two things, one a funny story. Um, so this morning as we were getting ready, um, my daughter was playing a little game with her pink unicorn. <laughs> and uh, her pink unicorn was the mayor. <laughs> and she was having a conversation with the mayor, the pink mm -hmm. unicorn, and she was just talking about, you know, kind of, I want to fix the city, just, you know, just, I guess, what she hears her mom talking about. <laughs> but anyway, I think that the, the nugget that I got in that was, was that every day we have an influence on someone, right? And so my daughter is growing up uh, with this impression of, okay, you know, it's, I can be a strong, independent woman, and, and that's a strength for me. I think for women, the greatest strength that we bring to our jobs is empathy. Um, sometimes that's seen as a weakness, but I actually say own it. It's what makes you do your job better. Uh, it makes you uh, break, get the best out of your, uh, your employees, your, your friends, your partners, and I think that uh, that's what I would say would be my parting uh, advice is own your empathy because I think it's the it's the piece that's unique to you uh, and I think it's the part that allows us to remember that this is more than a job this is about people and that uh, that we can relate in different ways and also bring something to the table to be six years old and have a pink unicorn again wouldn't that be great <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Great. So um, I'd like to go ahead and open it up for the questions that you guys have for the panel. So, anyone? All right, coming over there. Oh, they're coming like this, right? The dawn of your approach, Jessica. Okay, it's Donnie who started, so I get Donnie who started? I get to hold Hi, uh, my name Hi. is Shay, I work with Fleets. Um, and I have, a, you had mentioned people throughout your life saying, yes you can, and, and, and giving you opportunities. Um, when I told my dad I was gonna quit pre-law to become a mechanic, he's like, no you will not. <laughs> um, but he said it 
was because I would hate the fact that my nails were going to be dirty all the time. Whatever. So my question to you is, I'm, I'm stubborn, and that's why I went ahead and did with my, my path. Mm -hmm. But what do you say to people that hear, no, you can't, and aren't just bullheaded, and, and actually allow that to, to deflate them or to distract them from what they deserve? I mean, there's a lot, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of women, there are a lot of people that have heard, no, that's not for you, and then let that be the, them enough to discourage them. So I'm, I'm wondering what you would say in the face of that to those people, how, how, to, how to stay focused and, and know what they know and stay true to themselves. That's interesting. Can I just start? Because I, often, sometimes I come across folks who have all sorts of thoughts and opinions about who I am and what I'm like, and just by you know, a glance, they don't even know me at all. And so, and they can be positive or negative. But what I what I will say is that whatever issue it is, you know, it's their issue, right? It's not. I you cannot focus what you want, your goals, your thoughts on other people's perceptions of who you are and what you are. You have to stay true to yourself. So, and if you do that, you know, you're likely going to be satisfied and be okay. Even if you fail, because you stay true to yourself, you know, convictions and, and, your, and what you know yourself to be. Um, you just really can't start, you know, making decisions about what you're going to do and how you're going to behave and how you're going to, you know, try to succeed if you're looking at other people to, you know, their views of you because, that, you know, you have to do, be within yourself. That's all. And I want to clarify, I, I probably heard no 10 times as much as I heard yes, right? And I think that part of, you know, Carmen, you said it earlier, uh, that resilience, you'll hear no a lot. No, you're not good enough. No, you can't. Uh, I think the resilience and being true to what you know who you are, uh, I think that's important is, because I think it's easy to for self-doubt, right? If you hear no enough times, it's like, well, wow, maybe I don't, maybe I can't do that. And I think uh, it's find your North Star. Find the thing that grounds you, that that is true to who you are. And, and that when you hear no, I think that's where you draw from that well and say, okay, well, this is what I know to be true. And I think that it doesn't always work. And so I, I also want to be realistic about that, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but I also think that it, it to your point, people will say people have opinions and thoughts, and at the end of the day, it's it's what you know to be true. When you're faced, sometimes you experience that within yourself, and and I have yeah. little mantras that I tell myself, like mm -hmm. yes, you can, or <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I will find a way. I don't know the answer, but I will figure it out. I will find a way. Mm -hmm. I think the the other piece that we have to take from this is when you see a person that is hearing those thoughts, take a moment to say, yes, you can. And you have to be repeated a lot because if somebody's experiencing self-doubt, the one thing that we can do to help each other is to say, you know what, stop. You are great. You've got this, you can do this. And over and over again. And sometimes just that repetition, but you've really got to take a moment and motivate somebody. And if you've got that internal voice to yourself, you can share it with your friends and family and help them be successful as well. But I think just taking the time to resist the don't wallow in your own despair. If somebody says no, say, yes, I can. And help those that are hearing that same message to overcome that resistance. Sure. Other questions? Uh, hi, I'm Jessica Coleman from City Light. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, kind of going off that same question, um, you've talked a lot about helping other people and giving other people space, but what's your best tactic for when you're at the table and you're not getting that space? And for Michelle also, the panel and Michelle. Um, I am never shy about speaking up. I mean, I'm pretty small, like in size. Usually I'm the smallest person in the room. I think that, um, you know, my best tactic is to, uh, is to 
speak up when I have something to offer. I think this is sort of the reverse tactic of you know people who are always talking is you know because sometimes you'll find that that you know when you can add something to a conversation, uh, you'll find that people will start gravitating towards that piece of like because you don't speak, you're not the person that's speaking all the time, but when you speak. It's, it's valuable, and so I try to sort of balance that of like, okay, but you know, I'm also never shy to speak up, uh, even if I'm the only contrary voice on something. And I, it's not easy, Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I'm always sort of like, should I say that, should I say that? But then, you know, to my mantra of have no regrets, like I don't want to walk out of a room and you know, think to myself, oh boy, I should have made that, I should have spoken up when. Yeah, I, I, you know, reclaiming my time. That's, that's, that's me. It's like, so if, I, you know, if they're not giving you that space, sometimes you need to, you know, take a little bit of that space. That's not always the right way to do things, but if you feel like you're being marginalized or, or set out, I'm sorry, this is, if you feel you're being marginalized or set out uh, or set aside because of, you know, people are choosing not to hear you, then that's your time to you know decide is this the right place for me to be or do I need to speak up? You know I usually on the side of that's your that's your opportunity to speak up and, and you know make yourself known, not being obtuse but you know making sure that it's very clear that you know you're a part of the discussion. Letting go of that moment too. Sometimes you'll be in a meeting and maybe you didn't create that space for yourself, but don't be hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Go you know there's a next time. All right, I missed that opportunity, but I'm going to nail it the next time or have a different strategy. So have the, the sense to give yourself a break and say, you know what, it might not have happened this time, but I'm going to make it happen next time. Um, sometimes we strive for that perfection and we, we're too hard on ourselves. And so maybe you didn't create that space this time, but you're going to stop and go, you know what, here's what I'm going to do differently next time. So that's, that's my two cents of it. It doesn't happen as often as you want, but that's okay because you can, you can improve. So just keep at it. I think, Jessica, the only thing I would add is, uh, and I really agree with the other points that were made, but I think sometimes when I'm in a conversation I wanna make a point, I'm waiting for everybody else to like, get to that point too. So taking a step back and engaging in the current conversation and maybe, you know, sometimes egos are at play, but if you take part in the, the existing conversation and maybe add your perspective or opinion on that, it'll give you a little bit more room to maybe get to that point that you want to make in the meeting. So just uh, making your presence known and like showing that you're part of the conversation I think can help sometimes too. So we received a question in writing. Uh, the question is, what have you done and or are you planning to do in terms of pay equality in areas that are predominantly male, for example, police officers and technology? Are you going to ask the police officer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's what I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we have just, in our, we have a pay scale, so people at the same rank are paid, you know, based on their um, you know, union and bargaining unit contract. But what I would say is that we want to make sure we have people at higher levels in the organization that represent, you know, representative of the community, that we have a diverse number of people in the pipeline, if you will, um, at, at the different pay grades. So, you know, because that, the, the wages are determined outside of my scope and, and outside of my purview. But I want to make sure that as people move up to the ranks that, that, that you know, a lot of folks are uh, at the table and able to, um, you know, able to promote and, and get the higher wages. So in my response is just be mindful. I mean, we have a structure in place for awarding salaries and be cognizant of looking for those opportunities for making sure that we're applying things fair and equitably. And so just having the conversations with management and staff to say, you know, let's be mindful. We want a workforce that has an equitable salary structure and be mindful of those opportunities and look for them and help be an advocate when you need to be an advocate for those circumstances. Hi, 
Hi, my name's Nicole. Um, first, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I'm a single mom, so hearing what you said about being a mother helps me, uh, encourages me, because I struggle with it, with the work-life balance. Second, my question is, I'm lucky to be here today with my role model, Barb Graff. I met her at a young age when I was uh, working for a former mayor. Who are your uh, female role models? I love Michelle Obama. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really do. <laughs> um, you know, and obviously I love uh, Chief O'Toole for promoting me and encouraging me and giving me a vast amount of opportunities. Um, there are also, I also really appreciate and love Barb Graff. She's wonderful, a great leader, um, solid, honest, you know, she knows I think the world of her as well. So um, just, a, you know, a whole host of people, some that I've never met, you know, that I, that I look, aspire to be like them, you know, in terms of having integrity and honesty and uh, reaching out to the community and being somebody who gives back. And uh, those things are just important to me. So I really seek out people who do those things and try to model um, those behaviors. So, but certainly most recently, um, the people that I've worked most closely with, and certainly um, even Mayor Durkin for allowing me to be the um, interim police chief and swearing me in and letting me do that. You don't know where it's going to end, but you know, so far it's been great, and I really appreciate the opportunity. I have to use a cliche answer here, but. I'm looking at my mother as a role model, and I grew up with two younger brothers. I never felt like I was any different. I always felt like I was given all the opportunity that any one of my brothers had, and that instilled something in me that is with me till today. And I want my children to feel like they've got an equal opportunity, no matter what direction they want to go to. But just coming from a family that set that stage for me with my younger brothers has been something that I valued for my entire life. Uh, personally for me, uh, it, it's my two grandmothers. Um, I grew up with uh, spending a lot of time with them and uh, one of my grandmothers was the first woman to to get a PhD in her state uh, in English literature and you know and I just you know that was the you can be what you want to be and for my other grandmother it was just a sense of resilience and spirit and can-do attitude there was nothing that could ever sort of stop her from from uh, from doing what she wanted to do, and she she was a real strong road model for us, and really was work hard. I mean, you know, don't expect anything to be given to you. Work hard for it. Uh, I think professionally, this is not a cliche because I get to work with her every day. Uh, working with Mayor Durkin is very exciting. Uh, she is tough but fair. Uh, she works hard. I mean, she walks, she goes home with, with reading materials this thick and next morning she's back and she's made notes and she's read all of it. She asks great questions and, you know, and I think that that's modeling that work ethic of being fair, compassionate, respectful is something that I think we could use more of, and uh, it's what I would like to do in my role, but uh, yeah, it's someone I work with. Um, yeah, sorry, I wasn't invited to this one, but I'll, I'll speak up. <laughs> um, I think I have two different uh, female role models that I would speak to throughout my career. Uh, the first one's probably a little bit more obvious, it's a professional role model, but uh, when I was in the service, because some of those of you that know me, that I was in the Army for a bit of time in my career, and there was a, a woman who was two grades above me that I just really thought the world of. And the thing that I find interesting when we talk about um, mentors or role models, she, was very, she had a very different leadership style than I had, and I was just completely drawn to that. I just couldn't believe the success that she had had that, and her approach was just so different from mine. So I felt like out of everyone I had ever met, I had the most to learn from her. And I still keep in contact with her today and she's actually a commanding, uh, commanding colonel in um, Afghanistan right now and she's doing great things in the military, but just a wonderful woman. And the second would also be my grandmother. And again, it's a kind of common theme, although not on the professional level, but my grandmother 
was a salutatorian of her nursing class and then went on to be a stay-at-home mom for her four kids. And I learned so much from her. She was dedicated to um, professional development. She read so many books, watched the news, was up on every single talking point that you could come home after school with. And um, I think um, the one thing she actually taught me that I've just carried on throughout my career is just unconditional love. And that will carry on with you when your professional life or your professional or personal life. And uh, I would say it's those two people. And I just think they're just so different from me and that they have just taught me the most in my life. So. We have one back here. Hi, uh, my name is Hillary. I work in the Department of Neighborhoods. And my question for you. Um, is for many years we've had a cultural conversation about how women should talk in the workforce and often the message is that we should learn to talk more like men. Um, in other words, be more assertive, be more blindly confident. So what would you... <laughs> uh, so what would you say to the idea that instead of encouraging women to talk more like men, that we should encourage men to talk more like women um, with more collaboration, with more inviting other people to speak, etc.? I, you know, I just think being inclusive means take, you know, just meeting people where they are. You don't have to mimic or model anybody or anyone else. You know, communicate. You know, and um, you know, I don't feel like a woman needs to act like a man or a man needs to act like and whatever that means. Those are all social constructs anyway. But um, you know, so I would say this: be who you are. You know, be resilient. Uh, work hard, as I think that's a common theme for everybody up here. They work hard, they believe in themselves, um, in, and that you'll be fine. Um, and not, you don't need to model any sort of um, you know, gender construct that's out there. I certainly haven't tried to do that. Just, I'm just me, right? And then, you know, this, and this is the job that I do. So um, that's how I would approach it. And I'm sure there's other thoughts here. I think you take the, the best, you know, and so if sharing empathy in a conversation is what you need to do to help be inclusive and saying that you're confident and assertive, those are all good elements to weave in. So take the best of people's general disposition and apply it to your conversation. What they said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to add something to this comment just because um, I've seen it play out in my, my whole career is just that I think you need to, regardless of what you're trying to get more people to act like or be like, I think you really need to directly communicate with those that you work with. And like we look across the room, should hold all each of you accountable as peers, as you know, colleagues, and just let people know how their messaging lands on you. I've had people say some pretty weird things to me that I'm, I walk away and I usually talk it over with my partner. And I return and I'm just like, I'm not really sure you know how that sounds to somebody else when you said it. So I'm going to let you know how that sounded. And I think if we do that more for each other, we'll get better and other people will get better too. But I think it's really important that we do it. I, I can have, I'm coming. Donahue, Donahue. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Emily Burns. I work with the um, Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, I guess first off, I want to thank you so much for being part of such an inspirational panel. It's um, pretty amazing, you know, to sort of step back. I have a long-standing career with the city, and just hear about hearing about your different experiences is, is, is very, very valuable. I wanted to um, sort of pose this question in the um, kind of the context of retention of employees and um, sort of how do you as leaders encourage that collaboration? How do you encourage the people that are working with you and then in other departments to build and collaborate so that you're, um, you're reaching your visions, your, your goals, your, your objectives of the things you're trying to meet. You're probably building performance measures and different things that you're, you're measuring about whether something worked or didn't work. How, how do you work as a leader to sort of tear that, tear that all the way down um, through the levels of folks that are working for you and with you? <laughs> so I think helping to, there's a big element of communication in all of this. And so working with 
your management team and your staff to kind to craft that element of communication that transcends through the multiple different levels. And, and this is a challenge that I think the city has across the board. It's, it's not an easy thing, but to make it an objective is an important piece. And so looking at how you create that vision and making people feel a part of that vision is a big piece of how you would be successful in this arena. Knowing that your vision propagates through the different levels of the department is important, and it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, but being mindful that this is something that we want to achieve is half the battle, and then working on getting that message down. The other piece of this is when you feel like you're setting goals and you can also communicate the value of the organization and the value of the individual within that organization. And so there's an element to that, setting those communication goals, having it propagate through the organization, but it gives you an opportunity to be thankful for everybody's contribution to the overall objective. So when I try, when I work with, with people, I try to reiterate a couple of things. One is to remind people that they are valued, that they bring something to the table. Uh, and I think the second piece is, you know, I think we tend to be in our silos. It's just, it's just human nature. Uh, but I think these, uh, it may be a cliche, but it's true, we're stronger together. And when we are solving problems, more often than not, you will find that when we, uh, when we collaborate, we've come up with a more enduring or creative solution than if we were doing that by ourselves. So I try to model that in terms of kind of, hey, have we talked about including X department or Y person in order to, and you know, it doesn't always happen, and I think we can all be better about doing that, but I think, uh, I always try to think about who's missing from the table, um, and that often will get me thinking about, okay, what am I missing in this equation? And so I think that I always try to ask that question, what's miss who's missing from the table? I would disagree with, with, agree with all of that. Let me put this on. I would disagree with all of that, making sure that we're not working in silos. You know, for example, we have, you know, our navigation team that I went out with the other day. There are people from FAS on that team. There are people from the police department on that team. And there's outreach, work, outreach workers there, all three working together to address some of those issues around homelessness and all that. Whether you agree or disagree with, with the strategy, the fact of the matter is that none of us is going to do this on our own. It's going to take a collective effort to help work through some of these really complex issues. So we want to make sure that we are mindful that there are other organizations and departments out there that can help facilitate the work that we're trying to do. And here's our last question from Patty. Uh, hi, panel. And I'm really glad to hear this dialogue starting. And the question I have is around intersection, I can never say intersectionality. Uh, I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color, I'm gay, um, and I work in technology. So I, I have my whole life, and I used to be a union carpenter, a journey level carpenter, okay? So I have faced a lot of isms, and when I present myself, I can't just be one thing. And so what happens to me is a lot of times I can't figure out what is it people are reacting to. Uh, I have faced uh, you know, problems myself. I know I hear stories all over. So my question is, is when you're considering changing culture and policies, how you consider that? Because I'm not just a woman. So uh, mm -hmm. it has to be a little bit broader than that. So that's my question to the panel. I think earlier today we heard, you know, make look around at who's at the table and see who's missing. And I think understanding when you're having these discussions that you need to put multiple hats on to see if you've covered all of your bases. I think, I think that's the simplest way that I think you can look at have you addressed how this impacts a variety of different people from different walks of life and different circumstances. 
And I think asking those questions of do we have the right representation and are we advocating for someone that may not be in the room that needs to be heard? I would agree with all of that. Yeah, so you have to make sure that you're um, being inclusive, that, you, that there's somebody not at the table, that you're, think, that you're um, thinking about how you might get other opinions and thoughts and beliefs um, involved in the conversation that's occurring. So you don't, don't become so insular, because that's very easy to happen if you're not being very intentional about it. And then um, from the individual perspective, I said this earlier, but you know, you know, you don't know. Like you said, you don't know if they're. If, are they saying that to me because I'm X, or why are they looking at me? Because you, I have given that up a long time ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever they're thinking, that's what they're thinking. I got work to do. So that is sort of the way I approach all of that. You know, it's like you just. Life's too short to try to figure out, you know, everybody else's perspectives, and they're either going to change it or keep it or whatever. But you know, you have to be just true to yourself and your own convictions, and, and doing what what's, what you know is important and right to do. You know, as a policymaker, I often think, you know, we see policy as static, but I often think that it is organic. It it has to evolve, and uh, you know, recognizing that we won't always get it right. Uh, and bringing a diversity of perspectives is really important to try to get it right, but also having that humility to to learn from from mistakes, to say, you know what, we missed that, and here's how we're going to correct that. Uh, I think we don't do enough of that. I wish we did more of it, because I think that, uh, it, and I, I don't necessarily think we're structured to do that, but I think as as we do this work on a day-to-day -day basis, it's that question of who's who's not at this table, but also what have we learned from this that can make this a better policy or a rule or a regulation or whatever it is that we're doing in our daily jobs? That was the last question, right? That was the last question. Well, I, I, just, you know, I know you're going to wrap it up, but just thank you all for being here. This was absolutely incredible. People were very wonderful. The questions were great. And I, I just feel honored to um, have participated. Yeah. Thank you.